But first of all, it was very nice to be uh, praised by Ajahn Sujato, been a good friend for a long time. And I was telling somebody today that when they were praising me and thanking me, I, I told them, yes, thank you so much, I deserve that. <laughs> <laughs> because I remember one time that over in Western Australia, I was given a, an award, a prize from one of the universities for my community service. And I was really quite honored by that, you know, the first monk to be given an award by this big university. And when I uh, went there to receive my medal, uh, I had to give a welcoming speech. And now I was a Westerner, I was conditioned, so I said, well, this was an award for vision, community service, and leadership. That's what it was supposed to be for. And I said, it couldn't be for vision, because I have to wear glasses. <laughs> and as for community service, that's what you do when you're released from jail. So it must be for leadership. <laughs> but then I said, well, you know, that you know, without all the people behind me and supporting me, I couldn't do so much uh, in the world. And also that there's other people who do much more than I ever would do. And so I thank you very much, but I don't really deserve this award. Now that's what you're supposed to say when somebody praises you or gives you an award. But then I went to the award ceremony the year afterwards. And I was so inspired to hear what goes on in our local communities. And that next year, there was a professor of medicine at our local um, hospital, Professor Jofi, his name was. And he was the head of hematology in the university. And he realized that all the people he was helping treat with their cancers, that they were getting first class medical care but then after they had the radiation therapy or chemotherapy, they were leaving the hospital with nothing more than the medicine. He realized there was something missing. And so he managed to find room in his hospital, use his influence as a head of a department to find some rooms, find a sponsor, and to make an alternative therapy center within the hospital where the people who had uh, just had chemotherapy or radiation therapy could get the foot massage, Reiki, homeopathy, alternative, anything. As long as it was alternative, it was allowed in that place. And of course, people thought he was going mad and crazy. He was, thought he was uh, giving up his uh, rational academic training by believing all this stuff which was on the edge. But he told me that he did this because even if it didn't work um, uh, medically, when someone was giving you a foot massage, they were caring for you, they were spending time with you. And he knew that just a little bit of compassionate being with someone who just had radiation therapy or chemotherapy would have a remarkable effect. And so that's why he put his reputation on the line to start this alternative therapy center in the middle of a major teaching hospital in Western Australia. And of course, it was wildly successful. People who actually went to that alternative therapy center, the radiation therapy, the chemotherapy was enhanced. You know, the statistics said they got better, so he was going to get this award. And when he told me what he had done, I thought, my goodness, that guy really deserves that. He sacrificed his reputation for this idea, and it was working. He helped so many people. But when he went up to get his award, he said, well, without all the people behind me, I wouldn't get this. And you know, there's other people in the community who deserve this much more than me. And I said, that was my line last year. <laughs> and I said, you, mate, you deserve that. You've done an amazing thing. And it got me thinking that why is it that when people praise us, we just don't accept it? When people actually tell you, you're a wonderful person, thank you so much for helping me, we say, oh, it doesn't matter. Just no. Next time someone praises you, say, thank you very much, I deserve that. <laughs> because if you say that, no, you know, that's nothing, you're saying to the other person that they're wrong. You know, when they come out and praise you, you say, no, no, I don't deserve that. You're saying that that other person, you know, doesn't really understand what's really going on. They're wrong, they're mistaken. And it's also when you refuse praise yourself, it means you're losing this wonderful opportunity for encouraging more of the same. Because when people praise me, when it actually happens, I feel good about myself, I get more energy, more motivation, and it means I try even harder. 
to repeat sort of those things which cause people happiness in the first place. So, for those of you who want to have a happy, successful, wonderful life, if you're married, if you've got a relationship, if you're just going out with someone, praise them. Say, darling, you're such a wonderful wife. Boyfriend, oh, I'm so lucky to go out with you. <laughs> you try that, you know it actually works. As I always say, that praise gets you everywhere in life. One of the great things about Buddhism is we learn about psychology. We know about the mind. We spend half our life looking at our own mind. And also we're rebellious enough to challenge things. I always say that all religions should be rebellious. We should be out there not just supporting the status quo but questioning it. And that's why we're rebellious enough to wear these strange clothes, to shave our hair and to do things totally different than most of the other people in Australia. And we're doing that, why? Because we're doing that to actually make you question your own life. For example, you know, questioning the idea of like praise and criticism or why we don't accept praise. And questioning, you know, why we just use so many resources, you know, in our planet. Buddhists have got a huge amount to say about you know, the environmental crises of today. Look, what is the most, re the greatest reason why we're having an environmental crisis? Why is there global warming? It's not just fossil fuels, it's the fact we've got too many people on this planet. All that farting which comes out your backside, <laughs> all those methane. It's not just the cows, it's you as well. So I say that at least as a monk, I'm doing my bit to lessen the population of this world. <laughs> and I think if we really want to have to stop the probability of climate change, I think the government should subsidise more monks and nuns in Australia. Because <laughs> that will lessen our population and make it a more sustainable environment to live in. <laughs> but anyway, by questioning and by challenging we're adding to more insight and wisdom and more progress in our society. So that's actually one of the reasons why that as Buddhist monks and as nuns we can challenge. There's a saying which I mentioned a couple of days ago where everybody thinks the same, no one thinks at all. It's one of the reasons why in Buddhism we don't have dogma. We don't have anybody telling us what to believe. Yes, we have scriptures, but those scriptures are just what we call guidelines. I gave this simile, again I don't know how many of you were at the conference yesterday, but I gave this story which gives you an understanding of what sort of Buddhism is, the heart of Buddhism, and how it does differ from other sort of uh, religions in this uh, community. And it was a story which came uh, from many quite a few years ago, when in Guantanamo Bay uh, a marine was accused of taking a copy of the Quran and flushing it down the toilet in front of a, an, uh, a Muslim prisoner. And of course, many of you may remember that story, it was in the headlines all over the world. The Muslim community in many countries were demonstrating this was offensive, this was not right, even if you were put in a prison you shouldn't treat people like that by taking a copy of the holy book, putting it in a toilet and flushing the chain. So in Western Australia, a day or two afterwards, because this was hot news, I received a call from a journalist in our West Australian paper. And the journalist said he was doing an article about this and he was calling up every religious leader in Perth to ask him the same question and now he was calling me as a leader of the Buddhist community in Western Australia. He was asking, well what would you do, Ajahn Brahm, if someone took a Buddhist holy book and flushed that down your toilet, what would you do? And it's wonderful actually being presented with questions like this on the spot where you've got no preparation, you've just got to speak from your heart. And so straight away I replied, so if somebody flushed a copy of a Buddhist holy book down my toilet, my first reaction would be to call a plumber. 
It's obvious. I mean, what do the other people think like that? I've got to use that toilet afterwards. And the, and the journo replied, that's the best answer I've got from all the archbishops and the imams and the rabbis. But of course, you know, that's your sense of humor because you're practical. But I said to him, and I got serious, and I said, look, you can flush as many Buddhist holy books down in my toilet as you like, but I'm not going to allow you to flush Buddhism down the toilet. You can actually destroy as many Buddha statues, blow them up, burn down the temples, kill the monks and the nuns or anybody else, but I won't allow you to destroy and blow up peace, forgiveness, compassion, wisdom. And I made this distinction, which is an important distinction for everybody here to understand. The distinction between the container and the contents. The books are containers. The robes, the statues, the temples, they're containers. Especially the books. Containers. What's actually in those books? What does the Buddha statue signify? Why are there monks and nuns? It's the contents which are important. The containers, we can actually throw them away, recycle them, whatever. But the contents are most important. So why destroy the contents, like of a Buddhist book, which is peace, forgiveness, compassion? Why destroy that for the sake of a stupid container? And when you understand that, you understand just what I mean by Buddhism not being dogmatic. We can throw away the, con the containers. We will always keep the contents, the reason why, the peace, the kindness, the wisdom, which is underlying all of those books. So when people say, what is the holy book of Buddhism? I never say sort of this sutra or the Tripitaka or that book. The holy book of Buddhism is inside your heart. It's your compassion. It's your kindness. Someone's got a little spider there. Be kind to them. There's a spider in the front, or a cockroach or something. Just thought we've got to be kind to all animals. That little cockroach was trying to listen to my talk tonight. <laughs> so don't throw him too far away. <laughs> now we're kind to animals, you know, in Buddhism. That's one of our lovely things. You know, in, because I live out in the bush in Western Australia, you know, we've got 240 acres of beautiful forest out there. We've got a lot of kangaroos. Now we've got Buddhist kangaroos in our monastery. <laughs> True. You, you know the difference between an ordinary kangaroo and a Buddhist kangaroo? You don't. An ordinary kangaroo puts their paws like this. The Buddhist kangaroo does this. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true, by the way. I'm, only, I'm making it up. But that's one of the beautiful things. It's like kindness, forgiveness, peace. It's what those books are all about. So how on earth can Buddhists have a holy war? It's impossible for us to have a holy war. Because like peace and forgiveness are most more important than anything else. And that's in your heart, you feel that. Even like Buddhist ethics. You know, sometimes that I think Ajahn Sujata was saying that there's supposed to be ethics being taught in New South Wales schools right now. And of course there's a couple of people, I won't uh, mention their names, but one is a cardinal, the other one is an archbishop, <laughs> who are saying that we own ethics. And of course no one owns ethics. Ethics don't come from Christianity, they don't come from a god, they don't come from the Buddha, they don't come from a book. Where do ethics come from? From your own heart. You know what's right and what's wrong. For a good example of this is like euthanasia or mercy killing or maybe a more personal story. What happens if you've got, say, a pet, say a dog, and you take that dog to the vet and the vet says, your dog's got cancer. It needs to be put down, it needs to be killed. Now let's not call it putting down, it's going to be killed. Why do we always say just a word which doesn't actually mean what we're really trying to do? That dog's going to be killed. So what do you do? Is it right or is it wrong to tell that doctor to shoot that dog up with the medicine, with the drug, so it will kill it? 
Now, do you need to be told by someone like me, by a monk who's never had a dog, <laughs> about what's right or what's wrong? But what we can do as Buddhists, he can tell you how you can make that decision, how you can know what's ethically right, what's ethically wrong. And what you do is you look at that dog, that's your pet, that's the person a being you've lived with for such a long time. Take up that dog, look at it, and ask the dog what it wants to do. <laughs> Some people think this is mad, how do you mean ask a dog? You ask the question and look in that dog's eyes and you'll know what that dog wants to do. Sometimes that dog has had enough. It just can't stand the pain anymore, it wants to go. If that's what you feel, Tell the vet, it's the dog's decision. Sometimes you look at that dog and it doesn't want to go. So don't let the vet inject it. It's the dog's call. Now, you feel that that is right in your heart. There's something inside you say, no, this is wrong, I can't let you kill that dog. Sometimes you know that it's the right thing to do because you feel it because it comes from compassion, from love. And that has been a very practical piece of advice. There was one lady over in Perth, she took her dog to the vet, had very bad cancer in the bones of its legs. The vet said, look, there's nothing you can do about this, it's going to get worse, it's a very painful death, I have to put your dog down. And because she heard what I said, she took her dog aside, spent two minutes with it, and afterwards she went to the vet and said, no, the dog doesn't want to be killed. And the vet shouted at her, you Buddhists are so stupid and so cruel. You know, you're hurting your dog, you're supposed to be compassionate, you don't know what you're talking about, don't ever come back here again or something. She was very angry and upset, so she took her dog home. Six months later she took her dog back there, he'd made a full recovery. You Buddhists are very wise and compassionate. <laughs> <laughs> you're very smart. Because that's what it was doing. It wasn't actually just believing what you should do, but actually feeling it in your heart. You know, what is the right thing to do? Again, talking about making this, uh, art, sort of making, um, giving answers on the run. I remember going to a, TV, uh, to a radio show one evening. And you know, I've been giving talks a lot and some friend who was a producer of the radio station said, why didn't you come to one of these talkback radio shows? Because you know, you give much wiser answers than these other Jojos who go on radio. So I said, I'm up for anything. So the only time I could come to that radio station was late at night after I'd given a talk, a public talk. So I rocked up at the radio station a little bit late, only had time to put on the headphones before I was introduced to my co-presenters. And the, the uh, I suppose you call him the MC, I'm not sure, the guy who ran the program introduced me to my co-presenter, a, a Dr. Gabriel Morrissey. And said, who's she? And she's the leading sex expert in Australia. She's wrote many books about, on, on sex and relationships. I said, what show am I on? And she said, all about adult themes. <laughs> and there I was, a Buddhist monk, been celibate for 36 years fielding questions from the general public about the most intimate matters of their life. <laughs> I have a very interesting life as a monk. If you want an interesting career. <laughs> and so, of course, because you don't need to sort of have all that experience, because all relationships are about the heart, and that's something which I know very, very well. And so I remember one of the questions which came up, a typical question you know, from a taxi driver, because this was late at night, and taxi drivers, when they're waiting for their fare, they get the radio on, and if it's an interesting show, they, they rig up with their question. And his question, which I'll never forget, was, I'm having an affair with a lovely woman, my wife doesn't know, is this okay? <laughs> So how would you answer? Are you going to answer from the text and saying that's against the five precepts or you know that's evil or that's wrong? No, I mean as a Buddhist, you know, because you go right into the heart and you understand you know, exactly what's going on. My answer was, and it was actually spot on, 
I said, sir, if it was right, you wouldn't be ringing me up to ask. <laughs> and he slammed down the phone. I'd nailed him in one. Because <laughs> that's obvious psychology. People were only ringing you up to ask someone else, is it right, is it right? Because they wanted me to say, yes, yes, it is right. That's what they want, the answer they wanted, but they knew it was wrong. So that's the sort of answers which you get when you're sort of a very peaceful, wise person. In other words, you put aside all of that stuff which you've learned. One of my favorite sayings is that never allow your knowledge to stand in the way of truth. And too often people use their knowledge and it stands in the way of truth. The books say one thing, but you know this is wrong. Your experts may say one thing, but you know in your heart that's not the right thing to do. And so one of the great things about Buddhism is for your ethics we don't rely on books, we rely on the contents of those books. And again the greatest book is your own wisdom, is your own heart. And Because Buddhists are meditators, because we learn how to, to um, enhance you know, our understanding of ourselves and our contact with that inner world, so we know how it works and we can feel what's happening inside. And you know we find out what's right and what's wrong. One of the other nice things about Buddhism is if you do make a mistake, there's no such thing as guilt. That was when I first read my books on Buddhism and I started studying you know, how the Buddha taught. That's one thing which really stood out. There was no sense of guilt and punishment in Buddhism. And that was just such a relief, because I came from a guilt-ridden society. If you do something wrong, you're going to go to hell. If you make a mistake, you know, you have to feel sorry about it. And there was a Buddha saying, if you make a mistake, acknowledge it, don't deny it, bring it up, forgive it, and learn from it. Over in Australia, I call the AFL code, acknowledge, forgive, and learn. Over here we have no NRL. I don't know how we can make the NRL work, but anyway, acknowledge, forgive and learn is actually how we deal with things. And to give you an example of what I meant, in Buddhist monasteries, in our tradition, before you can become a fully ordained monk or nun, you have to do sort of an apprenticeship. Now one year in white, so you see all these white sort of robed men in the front here, white robed women, that's one year training as, as uh, we call it, like a, a, an anagarika. And then next year you can be a novice, and then the next year you can actually become a full monk. And you actually, do you know what the word novice means? It means no vice. <laughs> that's a terrible joke. <laughs> but anyway, the first year they have to wear white and they're just training and one of the rules we have for Buddhist monks of our tradition is that we don't actually eat in the afternoon. We have our last meal at lunchtime. Actually it's not really a meal, it's more like a banquet. So we have our last... <laughs> <laughs> we have only one banquet a day, <laughs> one feast. And then in the afternoon and evening we don't have anything at all. It gives you more time to be free to meditate without having to worry about eating. It's a great thing to do. All you women over here, how many hours do you have to spend cooking for your husband? So tell him, I'm a Buddhist now, you get one meal a day, okay? <laughs> I don't think it would work, don't try it. <laughs> but in a monastery that's what we do. So we had this young man, an Australian, who was just trying out to his training to become a monk. And he came up to me one day to confess his crime. He said that yesterday in the afternoon I was hungry, I snuck into the kitchen and made myself a sandwich. He said, I haven't been able to sleep last night, I feel terrible, I feel awful. So that's why I've come to confess to you, because I'm the boss monk, the abbot. So I said, well done, you know, you've, you've actually admitted that, that's wonderful, fantastic. Now I said, Try and eat more at lunchtime. You know, there's other things which we can do. We can actually eat some chocolate or some sweets or, or get some honey and have make yourself a cup of tea or something just to get rid of that hunger. And those are the sorts of strategies which you can use so you don't need to take the sandwich in the afternoon, okay? Now you can go. He said, what do you mean I can go? Aren't you going to punish me? He said, no, we don't do punishment in Buddhism. He said, I need a punishment. 
And he said, look, if you don't give me some punishment, I'll do it again. I know my character. I need a penance. Give me something. So he put me on the spot. So, as it happened, that day I was reading a book. It was by Robert Hughes, The Fatal Shore, if any of you have read that book. And it was all about the early history of Australia. And I'd just been reading that part where, you know, the early history where, you know, the convicts in places like Sydney, if they did anything wrong, they were flogged. You know, with the cat of nine tails. And so I said, well actually, I've just been reading this book and I have a typical Australian punishment for you. Fifty strokes of the cat. <laughs> and this poor Anagarika, you know they wear white, his face went whiter than his clothes. <laughs> he thought, oh my God, what have I asked for? That Jampa was going to flog me. Because he didn't know too much about Buddhism yet. And I said, in Buddhism, this is what fifty strokes of the cat means. We had two cats in our monastery, find one of them and stroke them, one, two, learn some compassion and kindness, you cruel young man. Because that was what he was missing. He was missing compassion and kindness, the ability to forgive himself. So that's what fifty strokes, if a person really wants a tough penance, we give them a hundred strokes of the cat, find a cat, one, two, as the cat starts purring and meowing and you learn kindness from these animals, that's why we have cats in prisons and monasteries, you know, because people need that, something fluffy, you know, to learn some compassion for. But there was no punishment there. And eventually he got it. Why is it in people's lives? that we always feel guilty, we want to punish ourselves or with anger punish other people for what they did to us. And that just hurts us, it say, eats us from inside. And Buddhism didn't have that at all. You acknowledge what you've done and you learn from it and have strategies so you don't have to make the same mistake again. And that's it. Acknowledge, forgive and learn. Well, that's such a relief from our guilt-ridden society where we make any mistake and we keep thinking about it and feeling guilty about it and punishing ourselves. I don't know how many people can't have a relationship with another person, they can't accept their love because they don't think they deserve it. I don't know how many people even can't be healthy and happy because they think that why should I be happy and healthy? I don't deserve it for what I've done. There's not one person in this room who's been totally perfect. I remember this thing which, it's amazing, just a stupid thing which I did as a young man, which you know, always haunted me. I always felt very bad about this. What happened, I was a poor student and I got a job, I was going to do anything. And you know the job I got, selling encyclopedias door to door, I actually did that. And the worst part about that was I actually sold one. <laughs> it was a children's encyclopedia. And I felt so guilty about that. That night afterwards I had nightmares about this poor family who were just struggling and they had this new baby, this kid, and I'd sold them this stupid encyclopedia for too much money, they couldn't afford it and I had dreams their child was going to go hungry, they wouldn't be able to pay their rent and get kicked out of their house. You know, the exaggerations which the mind gives. And I felt terrible about that for years. Now I, said, I threw in that job the day afterwards because I thought that was an unethical thing to do, to sell somebody something they didn't want. And it was for years afterwards when I told a story about, I felt guilty about this, that after giving a talk this woman came up to me and she was from England and said, this is just too much of a coincidence, it can't be true but it might have been because when I was a baby my parents told me this young student came to the door and sold his children's encyclopedia. <laughs> and I love that encyclopedia, it was my best book, I took it everywhere with me, it was a wonderful book. <laughs> well, I thought, wow, that's really interesting and I felt guilty for this thing and actually people loved it. Another thing, I mean, I tell people that one of the reasons why I became a monk was because when I was 20, 20 21, I fell in love. I was living with a girl for a while and she dumped me. And I was a really good man, she must feel very guilty about that. <laughs> but please, if you're out there, don't feel guilty about that. You did me a great favour. It's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful thing you do, dumping me for somebody else. 
So guilt is something which we hold in our heart, we don't let go and it stops us being happy, it stops us being free. And we don't have that at all. I was talking with someone in the car coming up here. You know, they're talking about like heaven and hell. Do you have heaven and hell in Buddhism? Yeah, we do. But you send yourself to hell. And you make your own hell. It's called guilt. We punish ourselves because we think we've done something terribly wrong. We won't allow ourselves to be happy, either in this life or any future lives, if you believe in reincarnation. And we also make our own heaven. But I always say the doors of hell are always open. You can walk out any time you like. You can literally let go and forgive. You can do that. Why not? It's the best for you and it's the best for other people. It's called freedom. You don't need to keep carrying around the guilt of the past. Nor do you need to keep carrying the anger from the past. Why do people keep remembering what someone did to you? It may have been ten years ago, five years ago or yesterday. Why do keep people keep remembering that terrible pain of the past? You don't have to. You can let it go. If any of you want revenge, which is one of the reasons why people get angry, I can't let this go. Those people need to be taught a lesson. They need punishment. They, they need to be shown what they did. If they don't get shown what they did, they'll do it again. Buddhism has an answer for that. It's called karma. It's one of my other favorite sayings. You don't need to seek revenge. Karma will get the bastards anyway. <laughs> So that's a Buddhist saying. They're not bastards, but when I say that, people actually remember it. <laughs> it's just a teaching technique. <laughs> so you don't need to seek revenge. And actually, the people don't need to be hurt. They need just a bit of forgiveness, a bit of compassion, a bit of kindness. And that's why that whenever you've actually given compassion and kindness to people, it's amazing how they grow. You know, part of my history when I first came to Australia, before I got really busy teaching people all over the place, I used to um, go into the prisons and teach in prison. And what well, is about ten years ago, I got this wonderful phone call. Look, I don't mind receiving praise because I realize, yeah, it's actually telling me something. I've done right and wonderful and I learn a lot from the praise. And the praise which I got was from a prison officer in Western Australia and they said, can you please come back to our jail and carry on teaching? And I said, look, I'm too busy now. I have to come to Sydney and go to Melbourne and go to all these other places. I got too busy now. I'm supposed to be a monk. I'm not supposed to be busy. And I said, no, look, I can't come. I'll send another monk. And they said, no, we want you. I said, why? Why me? And he said that he'd been in the prison service all his life. He said he noticed something unique. He said, every prisoner who came to your class never came back to prison again. And they said, well, that's why we want you back. And I thought, why was that the case? And this was actually praise from a prison officer. Why was that the case? And I think it was because I taught those prisoners forgiveness. No one else can forgive you. Jesus, God, Allah, Mohammed or whatever, no one else can forgive you. Only yourself can forgive you. You may tell another person, I seek your forgiveness, but that's only just a stepping stone to forgiving yourself and letting go of your own guilt. And until you can let go of your own guilt, you'll never be able to forgive another being. So you have to let go of your own guilt to be able to forgive yourself. And that's what I taught those prisoners. And how I taught them how to forgive themselves. A very simple technique was to learning, teaching them, showing them something inside of themselves to respect. The first step of forgiveness is seeing something worthy of forgiveness. Another story which shows you how this works. It was a story of, I read about this man's funeral in the United States. On the eulogies, these are when people come up and say some words about that person and the most important part of their life. 
And the wife, the widow, came up to give the eulogy for her husband. <coughs> and she said, her husband carried this piece of paper in his wallet throughout his life. And she got this piece of paper. It was half a page. And she said, this piece of paper solved most of his suffering and pain which he experienced in life. When he was, whenever he was down and depressed, he would take out this paper, contemplate it, look at it, and all of his anger, all of his depression and guilt would disappear. And said, this is the story behind that piece of paper, said the woman. When he was in high school, you know, all boys in the class, there was some disagreement and the class was about to erupt into a fight. And he said the teacher ordered them, shouted at them to sit down before the fight erupted and said, tear out one sheet from your exercise book, which they all had to do. Draw a vertical line down the middle of that page and on the top write down the name of the boy in this class you hate the most. Your enemy, the biggest enemy in this class. And on the left hand side of that page write down why you hate them so much. And they did that joyfully. <laughs> and when they finished filling up that left hand side of the page, the teacher said, now on the right hand side of the page, write down something you respect and admire in that enemy. Can't do it, sir. Do it! And that took them a longer time, but they managed to write down something in that right hand side of something they admired and respected in the person they hated. Now, said the teacher, fold it carefully along that line, tear it in half. I'm coming around with a waste basket to collect the left hand side, all the things you hate about that person. And she did that. The right hand side, all the things you respect and admire in your enemy. Go and give it to them. And she said, this was the piece of paper my husband received as a teenage boy from one of the people who hated him. All the things which his enemy could see inside of him which he respected and admired. And from that, every time he was depressed, feeling guilty, he would look at that and think, this is what my enemy saw in myself. Why can't I see this in myself as well? Whenever he got angry at somebody else, when someone was angry at me, they saw this beauty in myself. Why can't I see that in them? And once you manage to see something to admire and respect in yourself or someone else, that's where forgiveness starts. It gives you a reason to forgive. The person does not need to be destroyed, there's something worth saving. And that's what I did in prisons. When I saw somebody, they could be a murderer. Actually, you know I never saw a murderer or a thief or a rapist in jail. I went to many prisons, many jails. But never once did I see a murderer, never once did I see a thief. I never saw a criminal. To this day I've never seen a criminal in jail. All I've seen is a person who's done a crime, a person who's murdered, a person who's stolen, a person who's raped, but I've never seen a rapist. Do you get the message? Do you get the difference there? If they're a murderer, is that all they are? If they're a rapist, is that the whole totality of their being? No, they're a person who's raped, they're a person who's murdered, they're a person who's stolen. They're bigger than that. And what I was doing was noticing the other part of them, the part of them which wasn't a criminal. And when I noticed that, and I talked to that, they saw it in themselves. My goodness, I'm not a thief, I'm not a criminal, I'm just a person who's done a crime. Which meant they could let go of that guilt, because they saw something in themselves which was much bigger than that. You know, that is not a small thing. It not only managed to get those people in prison never to go back again because they saw something else inside of them worth forgiving, worth cultivating, so that's what grew in their time in prison. That's what was there afterwards when they left. 
I went to give some talks at the Institute of Mental Health in Singapore on their, I think, 50th anniversary. They, paid my, they gave me business class tickets to go to Singapore to give a keynote. It's really good being a monk. <laughs> so I gave this keynote at this hospital, just the simple things which I'm teaching here. And afterwards, one of the, uh, the heads of department, the head of the uh, schizophrenia department in Singapore, said, I would like to sort of compliment you on your talk and tell you your state of the art, because in this hospital, in my department, when people come in, we never treat the schizophrenia, we don't treat the psychosis. We treat the other part of that person. And I really got interested. Because I said, this is actually what I would recommend as a, a meditator, as a monk who knows how the mind works. Because if you treat the schizophrenia, you're telling them that's a schizophrenic, that's all they are, and that part of them will grow. If you treat the other part of them, you're telling them there's more to you than that, and that part will grow. To put it easily to understand, if you water the weeds, weeds grow, if you water the flowers, the flowers grow. If you look at all the faults in you and other people, that grows. If you look at the good part of another person, the part which is healthy, which is beautiful, that grows. Please never water the flower, never water the weeds in yourself, water the flowers. And their flowers grow. And instead of having a huge amount of success, because if someone is a schizophrenic, they actually think they're a schizophrenic, they become a schizophrenic. That's who they are. Now, I was a teacher for one year before I became a monk in a high school. I made the joke yesterday that I don't know if there's any high school teachers here, but you know, it's so stressful, traumatic teaching teenagers. That's one of the reasons why I left the world to become a monk. <laughs> I'm sure it makes many teachers feel of leaving the world and joining me. But one of the things which I learned in educational psychology it was a classic experiment which was done in England. It must have been about 40, 50 years ago now. They had two classes the same year in a high school. And at the end of the year, they gave end-of-year examination. So they could actually stream the children for next year. However, that particular year in that school, they did an experiment, some educational psychologists. There were two psychologists and the headmistress there. These were the only people who knew what was happening. Because what they did, when they got the results from the end of the year examination of these, say, 60 children, the child who came top, who came first, was allocated the next year in the same class to the child who came fifth, sorry, who came fourth and fifth, and eighth and ninth, and twelfth and thirteenth, and sixteenth and seventeenth. They went in the same class as a child who came top. The children who came second and third, sixth and seventh, tenth and eleventh, they were all in the same class. In other words, they split those two classes up as evenly as possible for the next year. And the principal tried to choose teachers she thought was equal ability. They allocated classes with equal facilities. They made everything as equal as possible except for one thing. They called one class A and the other one class B. <laughs> but they were actually equal ability. And they waited for one year to see what would happen. And of course, I think you could expect to know what happened. The children in class A, and they were exactly academically equal from the year before, did so much better than the children in class B. It was actually exactly what you would have expected if class A was actually chosen as the top half from the previous year's exams. What had happened is all the people in class A became class A children. The parents told some of the kids, look, I don't know how you've done this, you haven't done any homework all year, but you got into class A, well done, son, have some extra pocket money. <laughs> and the kids in class B, you've got to work harder. But I have been hard working harder, son, no going out to parties, no pocket money, because they were treated as class B children. They literally became class B kids. 
And that was a classic experiment to show that you're a criminal, you're a thief, you're a murderer. And if you believe that for too long, if you said you're a murderer, you actually become a murderer. You become a criminal. Simply because that's the psychology of the mind. So if you have guilt, you think you're bad, you're terrible, you actually become bad and terrible. If you think, I'm a schizophrenic, I'm a schizo I'm psychotic, you actually become that. It increases it. So those psychologists, psychiatrists in Singapore Institute of Mental Health were right on the spot with Buddhist philosophy. Forgiving means putting aside the negative, focusing more on the positive side of yourself and of others. You find that positive side actually grows. You become a happier, healthier human being. Another example, when you go and visit someone in hospital, what's the first thing you say to your darling mother when you go and visit her? How are you feeling today, mum? That's the most stupid question to ask. They're in bloody hospital, they feel terrible. If they were okay, they wouldn't be in there, would they? There was a... Now we've got monks from all traditions, nuns from all traditions over here. Look, we don't worry about traditions and gender in Buddhism. Just we're all Buddhists and that's good enough. I don't care what tradition you come from, what race, what gender. But I remember there was one Tibetan nun in Perth many years ago. She started to get sick. She came to stay in my monastery. I don't care she was Tibetan. I'm Theravada Thai. There's no difference at all. She came to stay. She got sicker and sicker. She had to go into palliative care. She was in the hospice. I would go and visit her regularly and then one day she gave me a call in my monastery. She said, look, I'm dying. I need you straight away. It's amazing just how people know when they're dying. She died the next day, although no one knew exactly when she would die, but she did. So I dropped everything and did a long journey, about an hour and a quarter, and I dropped everything I was doing to go and visit this lady. When I turned up at the hospice, you can't get into just a room when someone is that sick. I had to check in with the, the duty nurse. And the duty nurse was this Irish Catholic nurse. And when I said, look, I've come to see this person, she said, I'm sorry but she's given strict instructions for no visitors. And I said, look, I've come an hour and a quarter away. He said, I don't care where you've come from. The patient's wishes have to prevail. Sorry, you can't go in. But she just called me an hour and a quarter ago. And she said, listen, come here. She was really angry at me. And she dragged me to the door of this patient's room. And there was a big sign, absolutely no visitors. And the Irish nurse said, see? And I looked at it, and actually, it was in small letters underneath, except for Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> and I know it was a cruel thing to do, but I couldn't resist. I said to that nurse, see? <laughs> well, I confess, I enjoyed that. <laughs> so she, she went away in a hump. And I went in the door, but then I asked that, that, that um, Tibetan nun, I said, why, why did you write that on the door? You know, absolutely no visitors except for me. And she actually told me, and I, I, I really want to share this with everybody, she said, because you're the only person who comes into this room and doesn't ask me how I feel. <laughs> Instead you come here and tell me jokes. <laughs> Please can we tell me the next joke? And, and I was talking to her, I wasn't talking to the sickness. So look, when you go and visit someone in hospital, please be wise and compassionate enough not to talk to the sickness, but talk to the person. The nurses, the doctors, that's what they ask of them, that's their job. Your job is to talk to something much bigger, they're not so sort of the cancer person, they're the person with cancer. So talk to the other part of them. They want to know about anything, any joke. I, was to I told actually the latest Buddhist joke this afternoon. Do you want to hear a Buddhist joke? <laughs> yes, I said. You know that when Buddhists do meditation, especially when they go on retreats, they do everything really, really slowly. Well, this one person from Sydney, they went on this meditation retreat. And they got so quiet and so still. Even when they walked, they walked so mindful and so slow. 
And even when they drove to work, you know, they didn't mind getting a red light because then they could go slowly and calmly. And when somebody wanted to come in, come in in front of me, fine. And so actually they were working at Taronga Zoo. And so when the head keeper saw them turn up for work on a Monday morning, he said, what can we do with this guy? Look how slow he goes. He said, I've got the great job for you. You can look after the tortoise enclosure. <laughs> Thank you very much, he said mindfully. And so he walked mindful of every step to the tortoise enclosure. And that was his job for the morning. And the head keeper decided to check out on him at lunchtime. And there he saw him standing there. The door of the tortoise enclosure was open and all the tortoises were gone. <laughs> and the keeper said, what happened? Well, he said, I opened the gate and whoosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Buddhist joke. <laughs> so, of course, when you make people laugh in hospital, you know, you know, just the endomorphins, you know, the nature's immune system enhancers, they get released into the bloodstream. You know, you know that sort of that increases their, their energies, it fights the diseases. So it's great to make people laugh in hospital, except for once I went to visit this one lady in hospital and she had a hysterectomy. And that's the first thing she told me when I walked into the room, Ajahn Brahm, no jokes, it hurts. <laughs> So that's the only person you should never tell jokes to. Someone's had a hysterectomy because you've got this terrible scar and it really hurts. But it didn't stop me anyway. <laughs> it's in my nature, I can't stop it. But anyway, you know, when you go in hospital, you know, if you go in hospital, look, this is another sort of piece of Buddhist wisdom. Is there anybody in this room who's never been sick in their life? If you are, put your hand up, please. Be honest, anyone who's never been sick? Okay, so I could assume that everyone in this, sick, in this room has been sick from time to time. Doesn't that prove that it's normal to be sick? In fact, if there was someone here who'd never been sick, you'd be so weird. You know, people want to do experiments on you. <laughs> it's really unusual. You know, if you live for 30, 40, 50 years, you've never been sick. So why is it when you're sick and you go and see the doctor, the th first thing you say, there's something wrong with me, I'm sick. And that just adds a layer of guilt onto your sickness. So look, next time you go and see a doctor, you should say, doctor, there's something right with me, I'm sick again. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with being sick. But this is not a small thing, because we think it's wrong to be sick, that means that sometimes we're in denial of the sickness, we don't see the doctor in time, and by the time we go and see them, it's a bit too late. Why? It's because we add a sense of guilt and failure if we get sick. So look, each person here, the next time you actually do get sick and you go and see the doctor, go into the surgery and say, there's something right with me, I'm sick again. See what the doctor says. And say, so you go to that, see that stupid monk Ajahn Brahm, don't you? Because that's what happens in Perth. I told so many people that, that doctors know now where they come from. If they say, there's something right with me, I'm sick again. But what it actually does, it takes away the guilt and negativity towards sickness. Because sometimes you think, if you get sick, why do you get sick? You haven't been exercising enough, have you? Too much stress, not eating the right food. You know the, the secret of long life? If you, you know the oldest person in the world right now in Guinness Book of Records is a Thai Buddhist monk who lives in Phuket, 115 years of age. The oldest man in the world right now, a Buddhist monk. So we know the secret of long life. But it's, you know what the secret of long life is? Drink lots of long life milk. <laughs> of course, it's long life milk. <laughs> um. But it doesn't matter what you do. <laughs> A lot of times you eat brown rice, you exercise, you do the right things, you still get heart attacks, don't you? 
the most important thing is the state of your mind. That positive nature, understanding the psychology, no guilt, no anger, that takes months and years off your life. And never sort of thinking that, you know, I am sick and it's wrong. You're a person who's experienced a sickness. You're a person who has a cancer, but you're much bigger than that. If you remember that and treat that, you know, another example. Your husband has cheated on you. Is he an adulterer? Or is he a person who's made a mistake? If he's an adulterer, you'll get divorced. If it's a person who's made a mistake, there's a possibility of reconciliation, forgiveness and moving forward together in life. This is you know, part of the suffering of human beings today. Why is it people can't live together? You know, your partner, you chose them very carefully. You know, you, you checked them out, you went out with them. You know, we call it like going for a test drive before you commit. And why is it you spend all that time choosing one another and you keep making mistakes and you can't find a lifelong partner? But your kids, this being comes out of your tummy, you don't know who the hell they are or what they're going to be, and you love them unconditionally for the rest of your life. Why can't you do that to your partner? To so say, darling, the door of my heart is always open to you, no matter who you are no matter what you do. And that's actually what we really mean, like love. Now, I know that some of you think you've reached that stage in your relationship with your partner, that their happiness is the most important thing in the world for them. Now for you, you just want to make that partner happy. This is the acid test to see if you've got that type of love, that your partner's happiness is the most important thing. Imagine you co come alone to a talk like this and when you get home you find there's a, a note on your apartment door that your partner has gone away to Coffs Harbour with your best friend for a dirty weekend. <laughs> They've run away. How would you feel? If their happiness was the most important thing in the world for you, you'd feel overjoyed that your partner was having such a wonderful time with their best friend. We're having even better sex than they have with you. Oh, I'm so overjoyed, darling. You're having such a wonderful time. Oh, go for it. Take a few extra days because your happiness is the most important thing in the world for me. <laughs> <laughs> of course you can't do that. <laughs> you don't really love them. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, love hasn't got to that state yet. But it's a wonderful thing when it can get to a state like that, because then your your partner will never do that. You know, one of the problems with the relationship is there's not enough trust. There's not enough honesty in your relationship, because sometimes your partner, if they are sort of about to have a relationship with someone else they feel afraid to tell you. They feel afraid of what your reaction might be. And I tell this to Buddhists who are having those problems. If your partner comes up and tells you what they're feeling or what they've done, the fact they've come and admitted it to you is more important than what they've done. The fact they've come and told you should be respected so much they've been honest with you because if they've been honest with you, they're saying, I have made a mistake. I want to actually to fix this mistake. I want it to work. It's when they hide it, and you eventually find out, that's when the relationship has gone, because trust and honesty and openness has been broken. And I've done this many times with couples. It's part of my job. I tell them, look, if your partner has actually been honest with you and told you exactly what's happened, there's a huge opportunity for reconciliation and moving forward together. You don't have to break up that relationship. Honesty has been there. They've made a mistake, but they're much more than that mistake. The very fact they've been open and honest with you shows there's a great relationship still there. 
it can grow and many times I've seen that got people to forgive and they've had this wonderful time together and that honesty and that mistake has actually made their relationship and they have a wonderful life together and sometimes people ask me how many times should you forgive and the answer is always always one more time always one more time always one more time because forgiveness is spiritual, it's holy, it's way up there you know that sometimes our children we want to make them honest in life but why is it they're afraid to tell you what they've done and their mistakes because they feel they're going to be punished and it's because we don't value honesty and truth enough that people learn how to lie they learn how to lie because their honesty is not valued they get punished if they tell the truth it's important if you're raising children that honesty is the most important thing if they come up and tell you something terrible they've done forgive them straight away because you value their honesty more than anything else because with honesty it's called truthfulness you're truthful to other people, you're truthful to yourself and everything is possible, all healing is possible once we're honest to ourselves and honest to others that's the essence of any relationship, that's the essence of every, any spiritual path that's what the Buddha said to his son be honest, be truthful, if you made a mistake just own up to it, it will be forgiven but if people feel it's not going to be forgiven, who's going to own up? you know one of the greatest uh, pieces of wisdom in the national sphere which happened recently was Archbishop Desmond Tutu's Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa it's a brilliant piece of social politics or whatever after apartheid was dismantled in South Africa after all these terrible terrible crimes were committed this great Archbishop, he did get the Nobel Peace Prize I think didn't he? I think he did, yeah he's a Nobel Peace Prize winner he decided the only way forward was to have this Truth and Reconciliation Commission where any person from any side, either South African white police or the ANC, black activist as long as they came up to this commission and they confessed, admitted what they had done there would be amnesty, they would not be punished because truth was, honesty was valued so much more than anything else and you saw just how far that forgiveness could go and it was beautiful, it was moving I remember reading some of the stories from that Truth and Reconciliation Commission and one of the most moving stories was a white South African police officer was confessing how he had tortured and killed a black African activist in front of the man's widow imagine that that was the man you'd loved and committed to the father of your children who just disappeared one day and now you are hearing what happened to him being tortured and killed by the man who did it and the fellow was shaking and crying because imagine what it's like to admit that in public in front of his lover and when he finished his testimony this big black woman the wife, the widow went for him the court officers were supposed to stop this but they froze and she put her big black arms around this white murderer of her husband and said I forgive you and everyone burst into tears it was one of those iconic moments of how these terrible things which happened in the past could be resolved and people could go back on together a black widow putting her big arms around a white murderer it's beautiful and they both cried, everybody cried that was something spiritual and holy that was forgiveness, that's the only way forward so if your husband, your wife comes up and says look I've committed adultery, I've made a mistake truth and reconciliation put your arms around them and see if you can get that in your heart I forgive you, thank you for letting me know what a wonderful relationship that would be 
If that happens to your kid, honesty is so important. And that's the only way we could go forward. All this revenge business, all this having to get an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, where's that going to lead our world? If I was President of the United States after 9-11, I would have gone on TV and said, Osama bin Laden, whoever killed all these thousands of people, there's enough deaths already, I forgive you all. And I can imagine what would happen in the Islamic capitals of the world. There'll be people going around with these pictures of, of George W. Bush, George W. Bush, instead of Osama bin Laden. Because that forgiveness is beautiful, it's wonderful. And that's what I found in Buddhism, you can forgive anything. You can let go of the past, you can let go of the pain, you can let go of the anger. You can become free. And in that freedom, we cannot be defined by the past. A lot of times our past can be painful, can be, have a lot of revenge, a lot of ill will, a lot of pain. Why do we keep carrying that around? Why are there so many people in the hospitals of Sydney and other countries in the world with cancer? That pain in your heart is coming out as sickness in your body. Any psychologist will know that. So if you can forgive and let go, not only have emotional health, but huge amounts of physical health as well. Why not? So that was one of the most beautiful parts of Buddhism. No guilt, no punishment. And this is not just being irresponsible, but it's understanding how the human mind and body work and how we can have peace, how we can have health and happiness for ourselves and for others and for the future of our world. Thank you for listening. Sadhu, 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 or clap. Go on, you can clap. Thank you, I deserve that. <laughs> <laughs>